bihi wa man walah amma ba'd many of you know that uh, i regularly teach the seerah in many different venues many different locations and uh, alhamdulillah i i do consider it to be one of my specialities one of my areas that i really enjoy teaching and I firmly believe, and anybody who's listened to my seerah lectures can attest to that, I firmly believe that the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, it always deserves a fresh look. It's always something that every Islamic society, every single Islamic group can turn to and find parallels in their own situation, find motifs, find things that are of relevance to them. In other words, the seerah always remains fresh, no matter how many years elapse between us and the Prophet Sallallahu no matter what society, what time, what place we live in, wherever we are, whenever we are, we're always going to find new ideas. We're always going to find energizing motifs from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what else would we expect for the man who was sent as Rahmatal Lil Arab, Rahmatal Lil Seven Generation, or Rahmatal Lil Alameen? If he is truly rahmatan lil alameen, then every single society and every single generation will turn to the seerah and they will be able to derive fresh insights, new iman building stories. Not that they're going to invent new stories, but they'll see them in light of their own circumstance. They'll see them in light of their own situation. And this is one of the things that I strive to do in the seerah that I personally teach. Today's topic is going to be very different from that which you've typically heard. Instead of concentrating on something directly in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what I'm going to do is to talk about a kafir. The entire lecture is going to be about a pagan, an idol worshipper. And we will talk about the benefits that we can derive from somebody who, born, who was born and lived and died outside of the fold of Islam. Because I personally believe that such stories are just as important and relevant to us to see what the Prophet ﷺ did with other segments of society, not just with the Muslims, with the non-Muslims. And the person that I've chosen, remember he's not a Sahabi, we don't say radiallahu an, he lived and died as a pagan. The person that I've chosen is one of the most famous uh, pagans and that is Mut'im ibn Adi. His son, by the way, is a Sahabi, Jubayr ibn Mut'im. His son is a companion. We say Jubayr radiallahu ta'ala an. His father, Mut'im ibn Adi, he was the chieftain of the Banu Nawfal. And the Banu Nawfal were one of the sub-tribes of the Quraysh. The Quraysh had many sub-tribes. The Banu Hashim, the Banu Abd Manaf, the Banu Abd Dar, the Banu Nawfal, the Banu Makhzum. Abu Jahl was from the Banu Makhzum. So there are lots of little tribes of the Quraysh. The, uh, uh, Banu, Abd, uh, the uh, Banu Nawfal is one of those sub-tribes. And Mut'im ibn Adi was the chieftain of the sub-tribe of the uh, Banu Nawfal. Now, we only have four or five stories about this man. But we learn from it many relevant things about the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The earliest reference that seems to we, that we seem to have is Mut'im ibn Adi's participation along with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when the Prophet sallam was a young man of twenty or twenty-two years old, i.e., before the revelation began. An incident happened that the Prophet sallam and Mut'im ibn Adi both participated in. What is this incident? This is the famous incident known as the Hilf al-Fudul. The Hilf al-Fudul. It's also called the Hilf al-Mutayyabin. The Hilf al-Fudul or the Hilf al-Mutayyabin. What is this incident? In this incident, what happened was, and remember the Prophet is not yet a prophet, i.e. Wahi has not yet begun. He's 20 or maybe 22 years old. He's a very young man at the time. What happened was, an Arab trader from the tribe of Zubaid came to Mecca to engage in a transaction before Hajj. And he sold his commodity to one of the no noblemen of the Quraysh. And the nobleman of the Quraysh said to this Zubaidi, and this is a low class tribe, come back to me after Hajj, I'll pay you. I don't have the money now, come back to me after Hajj. So this Trader did his hajj, then he came back to Mecca and he said, okay, I'm leaving, can you give me my payment? So the nobleman of Quraysh said, uh, you know, I don't have it, try again tomorrow. So he kept, tried again tomorrow. 
And once again, he gave another excuse. Try again tomorrow, another excuse, another, until finally it was clear that the Qurashi had no intention of paying the debt. So what does he do? He goes to the noblemen of the Quraysh. He goes to Abu Sufyan. He goes to so-and-so, to so-and-so. And he says, can you help me get my payment from that nobleman? And every one of them made an excuse that, look, he's too powerful. He's too rich. I don't want to interfere. It's not my business. Go to somebody else. And so this trader was left basically out to dry. Nobody's going to help him. So what does he do? He resorts to propaganda of the time. And that is poetry. How did you get your message across? What was your PR? It was poetry. So he composed a series of lines. He versified. It's beautiful in Arabic. Ibn Hisham preserves this. And the gist of it is, O oh, tribe of the Quraysh, you pride yourselves on your noble lineage. You pride yourselves that you live around the Kaaba. But what use is your lineage and what honor is the Kaaba when somebody can be cheated and lied to and stolen from in your midst and you don't raise a finger to help him? There is no izza in being around the Kaaba if you can't be honest and you can't be trustworthy in your transactions. It's a very powerful, scathing critique of the Quraysh that this is a public zulm done and none of you lifted a finger to help me of what use is your lineage and your Kaaba and everything when somebody like me can be mistreated in front of your face and you don't do anything? So, as you know, poetry would spread like wildfire and it began to spread across Arabia. And so the Quraysh said, We need to do something. And the one to stand up and demand justice was the uncle of the Prophet, Az Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib, the eldest uncle. By the way, he died before Islam, so he never heard the Prophet as a prophet. The Zubair ibn Abdul Muttalib. Az Zubayr ibn Abdul Muttalib. He was the one who said, we need to do something. And he called together those chieftains that were sympathetic to that cause. Amongst them, Mut'im ibn Adi. And he called together all of the others who were sympathetic to the truth and justice. And in that gathering was also our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the youngest man in the room. He was the youngest man in the room. And... They gathered together and they decided we must have some law and order. We cannot allow this injustice to go unchecked. So what's going to happen? They said from now on, anybody who is unjustly treated, regardless of whether he's Qurashi or Zubaydi or anybody, we will stand on the side of the oppressed against the oppressor. I.e., what are they doing here? They're instituting the first constitution, the first law and order. There was no 911, there was no higher court, there was no authority. This is the law of the jungle. This is the law of tribalism. This is the law of jahiliyyah. If you're Qurayshi, if you're Qurayshi, you can do whatever you want. And if you're Zubaydi, doesn't matter, you're way low down in the scale. So these people got together and they said, this is not going to continue. And they marched to the, the, the house of this nobleman of the Quraysh and they demanded money from, them, from him to the Zubaydi. They took it from him and they gave it to the Zubaydi so that he will seize his poetry basically and then stop propaganda against them. But he got his money back. He got his money back. When they went to the tribe of the, uh, the, the, the nobleman, by the way, he was very angry. And he said, why did you get involved in this fuduli matter? Fudul. Fuduli means it's none of your business. It's none of your business, right? The Pakistani and Indians here know fuzul ki baat hai. That's where it comes from, fudul, right? Hilf al fudul. So he said, why are they involving themselves in a matter that is fuduli, none of their business? So it was called hilf al fudul, the hilf of none of your business. Another name they have is Hilf al mutayyabin And the, why is it called Hilf al mutayyabin Is because in those days they couldn't read and write. They couldn't sign their name on the dotted line. How did they sign their name? They would all stand together publicly in front of the Kaaba and they would dip their hands into a jar of perfume. And all of them simultaneously would take that hand and lather it in one area of the Kaaba. This is like X on the dotted line. All of them together are doing this. And a public gathering, so this is the X on the dotted line. Everybody's witnessing the transaction or the constitution. So this is Hilf al-Mutayyabin, from Tib, from perfume. The perfumed Hilf. 
because they dipped their hands in the perfume and they, and they uh, basically rubbed it up and down. Now, the Prophet ﷺ participated in that hilf. Somebody will say, so what? What does that got to do with the seerah? Why are we studying something he did when he's 20, 22 years old? The response to this, this pact, this hilf, this treaty, it became the most honorable and the no most noble pact that the Arabs had ever heard of. Why? Because for the first time, there is a systematic law in place. For the first time, everybody is treated equally, regardless of your ethnicity, your background, your tribe. Everybody's equal. The Arabs never had anything like this before. And so they came together and they made this Hilf al fudul or Hilf al And our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I witnessed in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an, this is where it took place. Abdullah ibn Jud'an had the largest house in Mecca and he had a main living room where the people would sit and they have their treaties. This was their majlis. It would take place in the house of Ibn Jud'an. And Ibn Jud'an, by the way, was a great uncle of Aisha. And there are hadith about Ibn Jud'an as well. So he said, I witnessed the treaty in the house of Abdullah ibn Jud'an. Were I to be asked to uphold that treaty even now in Islam, I would be the first to do so. And I would not give up my place in that room for many red camels. Red camels means for many, a lot of money, for a million dollars, let's say. I wouldn't give up my place in that room for a million dollars. Now, our Prophet is speaking about a treaty that took place 40 years ago. He's 60 years old now. And he remembers when he was 20. And he's proud. He's saying, I was there. I was there in that room. I witnessed it. And I am the first to uphold it. If they were to call me right here and now, I would uphold that treaty. And I wouldn't give up my place in that room for a million dollars. That's what he's saying basically. For many red camels. Our expression is for a million dollars. I'm not going to give up my place. What is he demonstrating? He's demonstrating his pride at having participated in the treaty of Hilf al-Fudul, in the treaty of Hilf al mutayyibin This is the first incident. You will ask, so what? Where is our benefit? How do we find our relevance here in America? Well, think about it. Hilf al-Fudul. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is so proud at having been a part of it. He's literally, I don't like using the word boasting, but he's so proud. He's like, I was there. That's my treaty. I signed it. And I'm the first to uphold it. And I wouldn't give up my place for the world, basically. What was that treaty? It's a treaty that was meant for the law, order, and stability of society. And the point here that we benefit from is that our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was proud to have stood up for causes of social justice, for causes of civic engagement, for causes of public service and duty. And he was known for participating in such events. After all, he's only 21, 22 years old. He's the youngest man in the room. Why is he in the room? Because they know this is a future leader of the Quraysh. They know this is a mover and shaker. They know this is a man who's committed to the stability of society. And from this really small glimpse, we extrapolate. And this is the key point. Listen to this carefully. Before our Prophet ﷺ began preaching the message of Tawheed, before he began preaching La ilaha illallah, he had already established a social currency. He had already established a rapport. He had already established a legitimate claim to that society. He's not an outsider. He's not coming in with a strange message. No, he is one of them by blood. He's one of them by birth and lineage. And he is one of them by the actions that he himself does. In other words, by engaging in civic society, by being a part and parcel, by being concerned about the welfare of his fellow Meccans, now when he stands up with a new message, nobody can say, and who do you think you are? Nobody can say, where are you coming from? Nobody can say, oh, so now you're concerned about us. Where were you for the rest of your life? 
You see, brothers and sisters, let me be really blunt here. And all of you who know me know I get into trouble because of my tongue. I'm too blunt sometimes. And I know this for a fact. But sometimes somebody's got to tell it like it is. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I firmly believe that many of us, not all, many of us here in North America have made a big blunder, a blunder of, of huge proportions. And that is that we have restricted Islam and we have restricted Islamic causes to only pure da'wah of what Islam says and what Tawheed is and what Quran is and what Sunnah is. And we don't realize that Islam is a relevant message for all of society. That when we stand up for social justice, when we stand up against racism, when we stand up to fight against bigotry and intolerance, when we stand up to defend the homeless, to feed the poor, what we are doing is not just da'wah, this is Islam. And when we become a part and parcel of our society, and then we open our mouths and we say, you know what, we're also concerned about the education, the welfare, this and that, and we also have a message of Tawheed. Now the people will recognize us. The people will not view us as outsiders, as strangers. You all remember when Jibreel came to the Prophet ﷺ and he went back to Khadija scared and terrified. What did Khadija say? Khadija told him, Wallahi ma yukhzik Allahu abada. By Allah, Allah will never humiliate you. Innaka la tasilu rahim. Why? Number one, you are good to your relatives. Number two, you feed the hungry. Number three, you take care of the orphans. Number four, you help every charitable cause. Notice. Before the wahi comes, our Prophet ﷺ is known for being a part of society, for engaging in the causes of the community. Before he was known as a Rasul, he was known as Al Amin. Before he was known as a Rasul, he was known as Al Amin. And if he wasn't known as Al Amin, when he opens his mouth about the Risala, people are going to say, Who do you think you are? Where are you coming from? And the fact of the matter is most of us, brothers and sisters, most of us, we have done nothing for our communities. We have no social relevance in this society. We are not a part and parcel of the fabric of this country. So when we come along and we open our mouths about Tawheed and Quran and Sunnah, we do look like outsiders because we're acting like outsiders. Until, until we weave ourselves into the fabric of this land, until we become concerned. And you know what? It's not just PR. It's not just da'wah. This is a part of our message. This is our religion. Brothers and sisters, parents, don't you want to make your schools safer after what happened last week? Come on. Who are we kidding here? Every parent, didn't your heart skip a beat when you heard about the massacre last week? What if that was my kid? Do you know I live 15 minutes away from that school when I was in New Haven, Connecticut? I was in Connecticut for five years. That town is 15 minutes away from my house. How do you think I felt? What if those were my kids? What if that was my school? Yet, what did we do to make a change in this, in this issue? Where was there a national Muslim spokesperson to stand up and champion this? When we have issues of education, don't you want better education for your children in your local schools? Don't you want there to be no drugs, no violence, no alcohol? Don't you want your societies to be better? Why can't we have Brother Muhammad stand up and champion education issues? Sister Fatima stand up and say, we don't want this prostitution, this escort, this and that. So Brother, uh, Brother Ahmed stand up and say, I'm going to not tolerate this bigotry and racism. This person was humiliated in public and we will not tolerate even if it's a not, not a Muslim. That's the point here. Because when it comes to poverty, when it comes to racism, when it comes to crime... It doesn't matter who does it or whom it's done to. A crime is a crime regardless of the religion of the perpetrator and the religion of the one upon whom it was perpetrated. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the Hilf al-Fudul, the Hilf al-Fudul, what it does is it demonstrates for us that to be seriously heard by society, we need to be a part of society. And our Prophet ﷺ demonstrated that for 40 years of his life. For 40 years of his life, he has a stellar record. So nobody can critique him as an individual. Nobody can criticize his motives. Nobody can say that they have, he has a hidden agenda. His motives are clear. He cares about the society. The problem comes, as I said, most of us, and again, I'll be very frank here. We don't view 
fighting for better education as a part of our da'wah. We don't view fighting racism and oppression or bigotry as a part of Islam. For us, it's only the, excuse me for saying this, the exotic, the sexy causes, far away, long gone issues, Palestine, Kashmir, and don't misquote me here, Palestine and Kashmir are dear to me as well. But why is it, again let me be frank here, when we want to fundraise for these foreign causes, mashallah, tabarakallah, from the six to the seven digits, maybe even eight digits as a national community. And yet, when it comes to our local homeless kitchen, when it comes to feeding the poor, when it comes to feeding the homeless right here in your own city, where are the Muslims? Where are the Muslims? What have we done? And so it's very clear, brothers and sisters, when we are not weaved into the fabric of society, we will be viewed as foreigners. It doesn't matter even if we don't speak with an accent, even if we walk the walk and talk the talk, we haven't shown through our actions that we are concerned about this society. This society is our society. My children and your children go to the same schools the other children go to. The neighborhoods I live in are the neighborhoods everybody lives in. And unless and until we understand this, that the first 40 years of the Prophet's life, embodied in Hilf al Fudul, is one example. There are other examples. Demonstrate a commitment to civic engagement, a commitment to being a part and parcel of society. Why does Allah say in the Quran, Why does Allah say, To Ad, we sent their brother, to Thamud, we sent their brother, and to you, we have sent someone from amongst you. Why does Allah choose prophets to be from their own people? Because of this reason. Social currency, social acceptability, to understand your target audience and to be considered one of them. Brothers and sisters, now before I move on, I want to be very clear here. Being a part and parcel of society, being concerned about the problems that face the broader public we live in, this is not something we're doing merely for the PR. We're not doing this because we look good. So once we're standing up for, for oppression, then we do Islam. You see, standing up for oppression is a part of Islam. Our Prophet is saying, I am so proud to be at Hilf al-Fudul. And he did this before the Wahi began. He did this before Iqra came down. He is so proud. He said, if I were to be called right now, I would be the first in line. And I would never give up my place for a million dollars. What does that mean? It means that that Hilf al-Fudul isn't something secondary to the da'wah. It is the da'wah of Islam. And we need to understand this in light of the context that we live in. Frankly, as I say, and I speak especially as the immigrant population, I firmly believe the African Americans have done much more than we have. And that's because they genuinely are indigenized. Whereas most of us, we really, we grew up hearing about foreign causes and we never heard about local causes. Right? For us, we never heard about the local soup kitchen, about local issues. And that's not something, inshallah, we need to change as the time goes on. This is the first incident. Mutab ibn Adi was there. The Prophet ﷺ was there. The second and third incident involves things that Mut'im did that will come back to, to play in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The second reference of Mut'im that I'm going to give, it involves the infamous boycott. You all know the boycott. That the Quraysh decided to boycott the Banu Hashim. So the Banu Nawfal, the Banu Makhzum, the Banu Abdaddar, the Banu Abd Manaf, they all said, we're going to boycott the Banu Hashim. Never before had any Arab tribe boycotted one of its own. And the Banu Hashim were forced to flee into the valleys of Mecca. They had a very difficult life for two years. They eked out an existence. Guess what happened in that time? How did they live? Well, as Bilal tells us, they would pluck the leaves from the trees to eat. They would go to the restroom, defecate like goats do. Those droppings. That's how they would defecate for weeks on end because they have no food. And Allah provided them with some food. How? Mut'im ibn Adi. There was a boycott instigated. Mut'im never liked the boycott. What would he do? He would go in the middle of the night, take one of his camels, load it up with food and water and grain, with dates, and go to the opening of the valley, and then hit the camel on the back so the camel goes inside the valley. And a camel can feed hundreds of people. A camel can feed over a hundred people. And you dry the meat and it'll last a long time. And on top of the camel is a lot of food and water. 
dates. So every few months, Mut'im would go and send an entire camel. A camel is literally like a car for us. How much does a car cost? A few thousand dollars. That's the equivalent. A camel is not a cheap, it's not a cheap vehicle. It's not a cheap animal to buy. He would send an entire camel loaded with food. What? Even though he's not Banu Hashim. Subhanallah. He's not Banu Hashim. He's Banu, Abdi, uh, Banu, uh, Nawfal, Banu, Banu Nawfal. But he has a sense of justice. He has a sense that this is wrong and I'm not going to tolerate it. He went against his own people's boycott and he supported the Prophet and the Muslims through food and drink and grain. And then, after a year and a half or so, he along with a small core group of the Quraysh, they devised a plot to break the boycott. And the stories are beyond this uh, lecture. I've given them in my Sira classes. But basically, Hisham ibn Amr, Zuhayr ibn Abi Umama, Mutab ibn Adi, Abu al Bukhtari ibn Hisham. These four were the core main people. They met together secretly and they said, you know what? We're going to break this boycott. And they planted these four at different places in their gathering. And Hisham stood up. Hisham ibn Amr was the senior most in age. He stood up and he challenged Abu Jahl. And he said, Oh Abu Jahl, this boycott of yours, for how long will we allow our own brethren to perish? They are our own tribe. For how long are we going to allow this? It's ridiculous. We need to stop. We need to stop this and break it. Abu Jahl said, it will never be broken. We all agreed. Mut'im stood up and said, this is a lie. We didn't agree. I didn't agree. And then the third stood up. And then the fourth stood up. And so it was clear that a plot had been hatched. And, Abu, and so they agreed with these four. They agreed with these four and the majority voted to break the boycott. And Abu Jahl muttered that it is obvious you four have hatched a plot, which was true. They had hatched a plot. That every one of them would stand up at a different place and they would uh, basically speak against the boycott. Mut'im was instrumental in breaking the boycott. Perhaps the greatest incident that Mut'im is famous for. As you know, the Prophet's uncle Abu Talib died. And Abu Talib was his main protector in Mecca. When Abu Talib died, who becomes the next chieftain of the Quraysh? Abu Lahab. Do you think Abu Lahab is going to extend hospitality to the Prophet You see, in those days, the chieftain of the tribe had to basically, you know, allow you to stay. If he doesn't allow you to stay, you have to leave. Now, technically, or realistically, no chieftain ever expels his own blood unless there's a legitimate reason. No chieftain will expel his own kith and kin. After all, this is his nephew, right? No one will expel his own blood for no reason. But this is Abu Lahab. So what do you expect? So Abu Talib dies and the protection that the Banu Hashim had given to the Prophet ﷺ is withdrawn. That is why the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if. Because he has no protection now in Mecca. Literally, after a few weeks of Abu Talib's death, he has to go to Ta'if. Why? Why now? Because in our vernacular, in our understanding, his passport has been taken back. He doesn't have Meccan citizenship anymore. He has to find citizenship somewhere else. Because the one who issued him the visa, Abu Talib, it passed on to Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab takes the visa back. And he says, basically, you are persona non grata. You have no, nothing to do with me. So he goes to Ta'if, what happens in Ta'if happens, you know the story, now he comes back. And he is with, who was he with, who can tell me? Quick question, quick quiz question. Zayd ibn Haritha, the quote-unquote adopted son, Zayd, the only man mentioned by name in the Quran, فَلَمَّا قَضَى زَيْدٌ مِنْهَا وطرة. He's with Zayd. And when they are outside of Mecca, they stop. Zayd says to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, how are you going to enter Mecca when you don't have a man, you don't have the visa. How are you going to enter Mecca? You don't have a visa, you don't have the permission slip. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Zayd, O oh Zayd, Allah will help his Prophet and Allah will find a way out for me. And then he sent Zayd to a number of people. He sent Zayd to Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan gave an excuse, I'm sorry, I can't do this. He sent Zayd to a second man. A second man also said he cannot do this. He kept on basically giving excuses. Then he sent him to Mut'im ibn Adi. Then he sent him to Mut'im ibn Adi. What did Mut'im do? Mut'im said, 
bring him to my house right now, in the middle of the night. So Zaid went and bought the Prophet to his house. Nobody saw him, it was the middle of the night. Next morning, Mut'im has seven sons. He tells his seven sons, arm yourselves, wear your armor. And he wears his armor. He knows the Prophet is not a liked person in Mecca right now. He knows the situation is tense. He is the chieftain of Banu Nofal. He has seen the Prophet since he was born. He knows exactly what's going on. Arm yourselves. He tells his own blood, his own children, arm yourselves. And then he walks to the Kaaba. And everybody is shocked because in the middle of this entourage of father and seven sons is the one man they just expelled. And that is the Prophet ﷺ. They do tawaf. This was their custom. They do tawaf in public before make a public announcement. Big crowd is there. Abu Jahl is there. Abu Lahab is there. They're all standing. What is going on? And then Mut'im says, Mut'im says, with his armed sons around him, that, O oh Quraysh, I have given a man to the Prophet. A man means that visa, that protection. I have given that protection to the Prophet Muhammad, meaning Muhammad, if he didn't say Rasulullah, to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everybody's dumbfounded. Everybody's dumbfounded. On the one hand, he's allowed to do this. After all, he's the chieftain. He can give visa to whomever he wants. On the other hand, he is making a statement that could lead to civil war. That's why his seven sons are armed. That's why he himself is armed. He is putting his life on the line, not because he's a Muslim, not because he believes in the message of the Prophet ﷺ, but because he feels that this is injustice and he will stand up for truth. He will stand up for the causes of his people. He will stand up against oppression and tyranny and the hypocrisy of the Quraysh. He's a man of principle, a man of decency, a man of honor. And you can quote me on that. A kafir. And he's a man of honor and integrity and in principle. Why? Because he stood up to his own people. He put his life on the line and the life of his own children. Dead silence in the audience. What are they going to say? Then Abu Jahl says, sorry, Abu Sufyan says, Abu Sufyan says, O oh, Mut'im, are you granting him this aman as a follower or as a leader? This is a big question. Are you a convert or are you who you are and you're still the leader? Why do you think he's asking? Why do you think he cares? If he's a convert... He's going to lose all of the prestige he has. Whereas if he is who he is, and that's the senior mut'im, will still respect you. And mut'im never converted. Till he died, he never converted. So mut'im said, no, not as a follower, as mut'im, as myself. So Abu Sufyan said, in that case, we shall honor those whom you honor. Khalas, you're a mut'im, you have the right. And Abu Sufyan basically sealed the fate against Abu Jahl, against Abu Lahab. They couldn't do anything. Abu Sufyan said, Khalas, if you've given it, that's your prerogative. And so the Prophet ﷺ remained in Mecca under the aman of Mut'im ibn Adi. But he realizes it's a tense situation, so he's looking for a place to go, so he goes to Medina. And then the story goes on. After he immigrates to Medina, Mut'im dies a natural death. Allah saves Mut'im from the infamy of Badr. Allah does not allow Mut'im to see Badr. Before Badr takes place, Mut'im dies. Battle of Badr take place. This is the final episode, then we're done. The battle of so Mut'im is dead now. Khalas, he dies a kafir. The battle of Badr takes place. There is no longer Mut'im. Seventy-two prisoners of war are sitting in front of the Prophet on the plains of Badr. Seventy-two prisoners of war, all of them tied up. The Muslims have never had prisoners of war. They're going to be ransomed, as you know the story. And the ransom was a huge amount. The average ransom was 4,000 dirhams. 4,000 coins. That's a lot of money. 4,000 coins is a lot of money. Even in our times. Imagine back then. This was time 73. Do the math. We're talking about literally in our equivalent, tens of millions of dollars are coming in to the Islamic treasury. Large amount of money. Listen to this carefully, brothers and sisters. Surveying these prisoners, dirty, bedraggled, bloodied, dustied, d looking at all of these 73 prisoners, our Prophet ﷺ says an amazing thing, reported in Sahih Bukhari. Amazing. لو كان مطعم ابن عدي حيا ثم كلمني في هؤلاء النتنا لطلقته لهم. 
if Mut'im ibn Adi were still alive today, and he gave me one word to free all of these prisoners for free, I would, and he used the word filthy, these filthy prisoners, they just tried to kill us, these filthy prisoners, I would have freed every one of them for him. Let me ask you, brothers and sisters, Mut'im is dead. Why is the Prophet ﷺ mentioning a kafir, pagan, mushrik, idol worshipper in a hadith that is reported in every single book of hadith from Bukhari to Muslim to Ibn Hisham? Why is he saying, if Mut'im were alive today, I would have handed all of these tens of millions of dollars worth of it, I would have handed it back. Just he gave the word and I would have handed it back. Why is he doing this? Repaying the debt, honoring Mut'im even in death, repaying back the favor after all that Mut'im has done, the least that I can do is to get, this is, this is the, what do you call it, the, the badge of honor, right? The Congressional Medal of Honor that is given to, to, to servicemen for military acts. This is the 21-gun salute in our times, right? This is how you honor the dead. If Mut'im were still alive today, I would have given all of these people back to him. And that legacy of Mut'im remains alive today. That hadith of Mut'im is still operative today. Brothers and sisters, what is the point here? And with this we conclude, I have uh, been given the notice, it's time to finish up. What is the point here? The point is, and I'm going to be very blunt here. Frankly, many of us have been taught a type of Islam that is so unrealistic and unreal. We are taught, for example, where some people say we have to hate every kafir or every kafir is evil or every kafir is this. Some people say that if you invite a kafir to an auditorium or audience, astaghfirullah, how can you, how can you do this? If we invite any non-Muslim dignitary politician, the, the, some of the audience members say, la hawla wa la quds, la, how can you do this? My brothers and sisters in Islam, our Prophet is honoring mut'im in a manner that is simply unbelievable. The praise he gives to mut'im that one phrase that he said is living on in legacy till the very end of the day of judgment. My brothers and sisters in Islam, when Mut'im gave him that visa, did he not take it? Did he not accept it? Or did he say, A'udhu Billah, I can't go to a kafir for help? This is the equivalent of your senator, your congressman who's sympathetic to us. You see, brothers and sisters, every society has its Abu Jahls. Every society has its Umayya ibn Khalafs. Every society has its Udba and Shayba ibn Rabi'az. But every society also has its Mut'im ibn Adis. You can quote me on this. Not every kafir is evil to the core. You can quote me on it. Yes, his theology we don't agree with. Yes, his beliefs is different from ours. But you can have a decent, loving, honorable non-Muslim. That's the reality the seerah tells us. That's Mut'im ibn Adi. A person who will stand up, not for Islam, not for the Prophet ﷺ, but for truth and justice. And guess what? Islam is truth and justice. So when they stand up for truth and justice, when you find the Mut'im ibn Adis of your society, you need to reach out to them, to honor them, to embrace them, to ex accept their help against the Abu Jahls of your society. Brothers and sisters in Islam, we are fighting a very, very dangerous battle here in America. Islamophobes are running amok. There was just a masjid that was burnt down a few days ago. And you know what the guy said? I never met a Muslim. Everything I know about Islam, I learned from Fox News. This is not some imaginary tale. This is three days ago. I never met a Muslim in my life. The only thing I know about Islam, I saw on Fox News. And he burns or he tries to burn a masjid down, right? I don't know if you know, seven, uh, six days ago after the, the, the thing in Connecticut, a, a, a woman in Florida walked into an Islamic school with a sword. I don't know if you read this or not. Again, a deranged woman, but she had a sword. And they call us barbaric terrorists, right? She marched into an Islamic school in Florida with a sword. We are battling against people that have tens of millions of dollars, that have major television networks. We're battling people that we are a minority amongst them, 1% or 2% of America. Subhanallah, with this small percentage, facing such odds, now we're going to refuse the help of Mutab ibn Adiz? We're going to tell any non-Muslim congressman or senator or media personality, we're going to tell our fellow Muslims, oh my God, he supports this, he does that, we can't do this. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, let me be frank here, let's grow up. Let's grow up. 
Let's realize our future is at stake. The future of our children is at stake here. I keep on saying this in many audiences. The homeland of ours is not where my grandfather came from. It's where my grandchildren are going to be buried. This is my homeland. And we are now a part and parcel of this land. Maybe some of you still think of back home. I don't think of back home. Houston is my back home, by the way. This is back home for me. We need to start thinking 50, 100 years ahead. We need to start thinking of our children and their children after them. And the only way we can do this is after the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we get the help of the Muslim ibn Adiz. After the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we find the people who are sympathetic to our rights, who see what's happening to us, who see the mistreatment, who see the double standards, and we get their help. Media, politicians, people in the office, wherever they are, local people, local congressmen, whatever the case might be, we need to reach out, establish networks, have this rapport with our society, be considered a part of them. And then, inshallah ta'ala, when we open our mouth with the with Tawheed, with La ilaha illallah, people already know we are the honest people, the people who fight corruption, the people who fight against bigotry, the people who fight against injustice, unless and until we have our Hilf al Fuduls and we have our Mutam ibn Adiz that we honor and respect. How do we expect to gain that currency in our own society? Brothers and sisters in Islam, I conclude as I began that in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is infinite wisdom for us to benefit from. Every society, every generation of Muslims will turn to the seerah and extract new wisdoms and benefits. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala cause us to follow in the shade of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to walk in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala Allow us to live as Muslims, to die as Muslims, and to be resurrected along with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Muslims. And may Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us the shafa'a of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and may He grant us the noble look at His face in Yom Al Qiyamah. Wa akhiru da'wan. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.